I want to bring a Mother's Day message this morning entitled, Against All Odds. And I would like to speak to the importance of parenting when it comes to helping our kids succeed in life against all odds. Several years ago, I was watching television and I came across this show that fascinated me because it answered a question that I had long had. Now, the TV show was actually about boats, about boats, seafaring boats, boats that would dock uh, in intercoastal waterways and make their way out into the ocean. I was fascinated by this show because I had long wondered how on earth does a boat um, maintain its course and position in a violent ocean? I mean, I've seen the ocean, especially in a storm, and the waves can become ferocious. They can become powerful. And when you look at these boats, you wonder, how do they not just topple over against that kind of force? Well, this TV show helped to explain the answer to that question I'd had. Apparently, on these boats is a device called a gyroscope. And this gyroscope, among other things, helps to stabilize the boats when waves and wind blow and beat against it. It's able, the boat is able to stay upright and it's able to stay its course because of this device on board called a gyroscope. Church, let me make a statement. I'm, I'm 52. I have never in my life, in my lifetime, I have never known a time when the waves of an evil culture have beaten against our kids as fiercely as they do now. An evil culture seeks to blow our kids over. But what I wanna share with you this morning is every child has on board their life a stabilizing device something that has great power to make that child resilient and resistant against all those external forces that would seek to do them harm. And that onboard device is called a parent. A parent. Parents have enormous power in a child's life. In fact, sometimes I think most parents underestimate the sway, the influence, the power they have in their child's life to help that child stay the course even in an evil culture. So this morning, I wanna share with you about the power of godly parenting. We read about a young man in the New Testament and many, many, if not most of you, uh, are familiar with this young man. His name is Timothy. Now, we know who Timothy was. Timothy, Timothy was a godly man. I mean, Timothy was one of Paul's fellow travelers. He ministered with the apostle Paul. In fact, in Paul's absence, Timothy led the church at Ephesus, a church that Paul had planted there in Ephesus. He led it. Timothy was a godly man. But it turns out that the odds were stacked against Timothy. Timothy became what he became against all odds. For example, Timothy grew up in a place called Lystra. Now, unless you're a New Testament student, you may not know much about Lystra. Let me tell you about this place where Timothy grew up as a child. Lystra was an evil place. It was an idolatrous community. In fact, in one of their missionary journeys, Paul and Barnabas show up in this place called Lystra and they, Paul healed a man. So here's what the people of Lystra did. They heard that Paul had healed this guy. So they came running to worship Paul and Barnabas. They actually called Barnabas Zeus. They called Paul Hermes and they, the people of Lystra started making sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas, thinking that they were gods. 
Well, Paul says, wait a minute. Oh, we're here to tell you that, that what you're doing is completely wrong. We're here to tell you that the gods that you worship, that you serve, that you sacrifice to are worthless so that you can turn to the one true God. Okay, the people of Lystra were so wicked. You know what they did? When they heard Paul say that, they took Paul and they stoned him and they thought they had stoned him to death. They left him for dead. Lystra was a wicked place. Lystra was not by any means a bastion of Christianity. No, no, no. It was very different from that. And, and to make matters worse, many of you know this, Timothy's father himself was a pagan. He didn't worship God. So the question is this, how on earth did Timothy defy all odds and become a godly man? Answer. Timothy had a godly mother. Timothy had a godly mother. There was a device on board his life that stabilized him in a raging, evil culture. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 2 Timothy. This book is not only the last letter that we have that Paul wrote while he was still alive, but it's a letter he wrote to this young man named Timothy. And I wanna direct your attention to a couple of excerpts from this letter where Paul gives us clues about how Timothy's mother parented him to stabilize his life against an evil culture. We're gonna begin in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse five. Listen closely to what Paul writes here. Paul says, Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Okay, we learned something very important here, folks. Timothy's mother had what Paul labeled a sincere faith a sincere faith. Godly parents have a sincere faith. If we are going to be the onboard stabilizing forces in our kids' lives, we must live out a sincere faith. Now, let me help you understand what Paul meant here when he said she had a sincere faith. Sincere faith is the opposite of hypocritical faith. In other words, a sincere faith is held by someone who is on the inside exactly what they are on the outside. You see, our kids, parents, our children, know who we really are. You can fool a lot of people. You cannot fool your children. Your children know who you are when the mask is off. They see not only the mom and dad at church or mom and dad in public, they see the mom and dad when nobody else is looking. I was reading a little story this past week about a pastor who was going to visit a family in his church. This family had eight children, eight children. So this pastor was bracing himself for what he was going to experience when he walked into this home with eight kids. He was expecting things to be everywhere. He's expecting the kids to be all, you know, all over the place. Well, when he walks in, it's very different from that. He walks in, the kids are nice and neat. Everything is in its place. The house is spotless. The kids are well behaved. And the pastor looks at the parents and says, I must commend you on your home. This is very, very impressive. Congratulations on such a beautiful, wonderful home. And before the parents could respond, the five-year-old said, yeah, but if you wanna know how we really live, you've gotta come when you're not here. <laughs> parents, listen, we don't fool our kids. Our kids know the real 
you. And godly parents, godly parents, those parents that are stabilizing forces in our kids' lives live out a sincere faith. So the question is this, as parents, do our actions always line up with our words? Johnny and Susie, profanity has no place in our home. Okay, does what you watch on television line up with that? Uh, Johnny and Susie, I want you to know that church is a vitally important part of our lives. Do your actions line up with those words? Johnny and Susie, Bible study and prayer time is a vitally important part of your life. Do your kids see you studying the Bible and praying? Do your actions line up with your words. You see, one of the things that makes godly parenting so powerful in a child's life is that the child sees the same mom and dad at home that they see at church or in public or anywhere else. Godly parents have a sincere, authentic faith. And then secondly, turn over to chapter three, flip over just a couple pages in your Bible. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 14 and 15. Listen to what else Paul says about his mom. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through, through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy's mother taught him what God had to say about life. Godly parents teach their children biblical truths. Paul says, look, you've, you've, you've known the scriptures since you were an infant. Let me ask you a question. Who taught Timothy the scriptures since he was an infant? His mother taught him the scriptures since he was an infant. She poured into his life what God has to say about life. While culture was busy preaching a different doctrine, Timothy was getting the real deal at home. I was talking to someone about this not long ago. We we're talking about raising our kids spiritually. And here's what he said. He said, you know, my wife and I, we've decided, we've decided that we're going to let our kids figure out their own faith. We're not going to, we don't, he used this word. We're not going to brainwash them. We just want them to grapple with spiritual things so that when they come to their faith, they will own their own faith. We don't want to brainwash them. So... <laughs> I'm looking at this guy, here's what I asked him. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Have you decided not to brainwash your children when it comes to brushing their teeth? Or are you gonna let them figure that out on their own? Or what about bathing regularly? Are you gonna let them figure that out as well? No, see, listen, teaching our children what the creator of life has to say about life is not brainwashing. That's common sense. And, yeah, come on. all right, all right, now, now just hang with me. Now listen very closely, parents. It is ultimately your responsibility to teach your children what the Bible says about life. Now look, the church is here to help you. I will tell you, this church does all it can possibly do to help your children and help your teenagers understand what God has to say about life. But parents, we get your kids about three, three hours a week. It is ultimately up to parents to teach their children what the Bible has to say about life. So in the time I have left, here's what I want to do. I want to point to three examples. Now, obviously, of course, this is not an exhaustive list of everything we need to teach our children about what the Bible says about life. 
I've chosen these three things because in my observation, these are the areas where culture seems to be attacking most viciously, okay? So just quickly, three things that we need to teach as parents. We need to teach, make sure our children know what the Bible says about these things. The first area where culture is preaching a different doctrine relates to accountability and consequence. Accountability and consequence. Culture teaches a doctrine of entitlement. I am owed things that I neither earn nor deserve. In other words, if I do nothing, I should reap exactly the same as someone who works hard because I am entitled to those things. There are certain things that are owed to me. Culture preaches this very loudly. And there's a corollary to this. The corollary is if, if you do something wrong, you should do everything you can do to get away with it. You should be able to behave and act with no consequence whatsoever. That is the doctrine. Our culture is teaching our children. I overheard uh, someone talking the other day. It's a group of parents and apparently, apparently their kids were involved in things they should not have been involved in. And one of the parents said this, I hope to goodness they don't get caught doing that at school. I hope they don't get caught doing that at school. And I'm thinking to myself, a godly parent does not pray, God help my child get away with something. No, a godly parent prays, God let my child get caught so that he can understand the consequences of bad behavior before the consequences become devastating to that child. What does the Bible teach? What does the Bible teach about accountability and consequence? Let me share with you one scripture that might be helpful. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. You know, parents, you know what our kids need to learn? You reap what you sow. Teach them what the Bible has to say about accountability and consequence. Area number two has to do with intrinsic worth. My goodness, our culture teaches such an anti-God doctrine when it comes to intrinsic worth of a child. Here's what culture preaches. Culture tries to convince your children that your worth and your value depends upon the grades you make or the job you have or your ability to excel in a sport or a musical instrument or something else. Your value is determined by the way you look. Your value is determined by how popular you are. So church, listen to me. Here's what that causes our children to do. Our children, with their self-worth on the line, will do whatever it takes to be valuable according to culture's doctrine. They will do whatever it takes. And here's what happens every single time. When a child or anybody else tries to find their value and self-worth in something extrinsic like that, every single time, they don't find it. Either because they can't be good enough and they begin to conclude, well, maybe I'm not worth anything after all. Or even more tragically, they get to where they're trying to get to, only to find after they've climbed up that ladder, the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall the whole time. 
and anxiety, when they can't find self-worth, anxiety begins to grip their lives. Depression begins to set in. Parents, it's up to us to teach our children what the Bible has to say about self-worth. Here it is, Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Speaking of God, of course. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works, of which I am one, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You see, the Bible teaches that our children have intrinsic value because they are God's masterpiece. Their value and self-worth is not defined by anything extra. They have intrinsic value because they are God's masterpiece. I was in a museum not long ago and there were paintings all over the, all over the walls. It was an art gallery, paintings all over the wall. And I walked into this one room and there was a painting at the end that stood out from all of the others. Not because it looked different necessarily, but because there were ropes in front of it. All the other paintings you could go right up to and look at, but this one you couldn't even get close to. So I'm curious. So I walk over to this painting and I realized when I got close why it was so valuable. It was a Monet original. It was valuable because of its creator. It was not more valuable than the other paintings because its canvas was more expensive or the paint used was more expensive or the frame was more expensive. No, it was more valuable because of the one who painted it. Our children have infinite value because they were created by the hand of a creator God and God doesn't make mistakes. Parents, but one final thing, parents, let's be sure we're teaching our kids their need for a savior. Because here's what can happen in parenting. I know I can say this because I am one. Here's what can happen in parenting. Teaching our children of their infinite worth can quickly transform into teaching them that everything is okay. There's a big difference between be, having infinite worth and everything being okay. Parents, we need to teach our children that things are not okay. Yes, Johnny and Susie, you are of infinite value, but things are not okay. In other words, teach our children that we have all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Parents, you're the number one evangelist in your child's life. Make sure your kids understand things are not okay. But God loves us so much in this, that while we're still sinners, Christ paid for our sins by dying for them in Romans 5, 8. And that if Johnny and Susie, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe that Jesus is who he said he was, and you believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, securing forgiveness for your sin, you can be saved from the problem we all share. Parents, we're to be the number one evangelist in our children's lives. Timothy's mother Timothy's mother was a godly parent. She was a godly mother. And it made all the difference in Timothy's life. She taught, she had a sincere faith and she took great pains to teach Timothy what God had to say about life. Parents, you're not responsible. Obviously, you're not responsible for the decisions someone else makes. But understand this, you are a powerful, stabilizing force 
in your child's life. Let me close with this. Parents, listen to me. You can't give what you don't have. You cannot give to your children a sustaining faith unless you first have a sustaining faith. The best thing you can give to your child is a godly parent who has a sincere faith and believes everything the Bible says about Jesus and what he did and who he was. Parents, have you placed your faith in Jesus? Do you know him personally? Is the Holy Spirit of God literally on board your life, enabling you as a parent and enabling every other area of your life? If not, I'd like to lead you in a prayer where you can place your faith in Jesus. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Your prayer to the Creator in this quiet moment might sound something like this. Dear God, I recognize I've blown it and I need your forgiveness. I believe Jesus was your son and he died on a cross to pay for my sins. And then three days later, he rose from the dead. I believe that. And I'm placing all my hope in what Jesus did for me to rescue me from my own sin. Lord Jesus, come into my life as I commit it to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, everyone looking back this way. If that was your prayer, we have some literature waiting for you back at guest services. What is that literature about? It helps to further explain what it means to place your faith in Jesus. It's free, there's no charge, and no one's gonna pigeonhole you back there. Just go by, may I have the literature Pastor Jeff spoke of, and they'll give it to you and you can be on your way. If you're watching online, we would love to mail this to your home. If you'll pro provide us with your mailing address by clicking the decision response form link on the screen there and on the video that you're watching. If you're watching on uh, Facebook Live, it's in the comment section. And if you're watching on the mobile app, it's on the home page. Fill that little simple form out, submit it to us, and we'll put your literature in the mail to you this coming week.